Greetings from Hoplong Hollow. This is Jerry. I have spent the past week recreating a garden bed that I have redone for the last five years in a different style. And that would be what I call my basket, Hoplong Hollow basket garden. It's uh, right here. Every year I come in here, I pull out all the old um, woven fencing and I replace it, which as you can see I have done already. And then I do a new kind of planting so that the garden always looks just a little bit different. There are perennials in this garden which remain always, but I always try to add maybe different annuals, different color combinations, and different herbs to make it new and refreshing, just a different look every year. This year I decided to make something a little more permanent, and so we are creating a Beatrix Potter patch. Although it's been interesting changing the style of this garden every single year, I decided I wanted to do something a little more permanent. And the reason I chose Beatrix Potter is because she was, as well as a wonderful illustrator and artist, she was a wonderful and avid gardener. Once she moved to Hilltop Farm and became Mrs. Helis, she became quite interested in having her own gardens. And so we're going to take the plants that she used in her own gardens and create a fairly permanent Beatrix Potter patch right here in this space. One of the first things I said in the first Hopalong Hollow video I ever made was that Hopalong Hollow is the essence of old world charm. And old world charm is exactly what we want to achieve here in this Beatrix Potter patch. So we want to stay in keeping with the time period of Beatrix Potter. Let's go from 1900s to the 1930s is when her gardens would have been planted and beyond that. And to really get an idea of how to create this particular garden, I do have several videos on it, which I will link below. That will tell you the dimensions of the space, how to weave the wattle, and the fact that you really do want to put it up against either a building, a fence, a wall, or a large trellis. You'll want to place your garden in full sun. And what do I mean by full sun? That's either six hours of sun, which could be morning sun, or it could be three hours of afternoon sun, which is a much, much hotter and brighter sunshine. Nevertheless, whatever you get, morning sun, afternoon sun, or a combination of the two, you will want a nice sunny spot. Now this is going to be a pretty exuberant garden, and you can see that I am tightly packing things into this garden, but there's a theme here. And the theme is basically an old-fashioned, old-time garden, a cottage garden, more or less. I will explain each plant to you, why I'm planting it, and I'm, the colors that I'm using. Now, because Beatrix did beautiful, soft watercolor paintings, I don't want a bright and vibrant garden here. I want it to be stuffed full, indeed, but I want to use the blues, 
lavenders, pinks, and whites basically in this garden. There'll be very little yellow, and what there is will be a pale yellow. So I definitely want to stick with some beautiful soft colors in this garden, and we are going to use all sorts of things. I'm going to take a little trip back in time, just a few days, as I show you the video clips from what was planted in the garden and how it was planted. If you're a beginner gardener, I think you're going to love the fact that we have used seeds, bedding, plants, corms, roots, perennials, annuals, vines, herbs, and roses in this garden. So it's just a little bit of everything in beautiful combinations. Our reference book today is Beatrix Potter's Gardening Life. And in the back of this book, it lists everything that Beatrix Potter grew in her gardens and also all the plants that appeared in the Beatrix Potter books. So although we will not be able to put everything in this garden, we are going to put over a dozen different plants. In this garden, we'll be able to put to use a lot of the things that were planted in the Mimi greenhouses. Here we have snapdragons, bergamot, also known as bee balm, larkspur, and hollyhocks. We also use blue sage in this garden, pinks, and stock. Now I've obviously got a head start if you're starting from scratch. I'm way ahead of you, but it doesn't matter. This is a garden that because of the fact that it will have a lot of perennials in it and roses and clematis and annuals, this is a garden that will last for years. So if you're behind on the garden, doesn't matter. This is going to be a lifelong garden. So I have started out with foxglove over here and I have about 10 foxglove in here because I started them from seed last year in trays and then I watched them grow over the winter in a nursery garden patch and then I transplanted them into this garden. I would say one of the essentials for your garden if you can grow them is foxglove. I can't think of anything more Beatrix Potter and Jemima Puddle Duck than foxglove. Try to disregard all my barricades because they will be coming up once I get the garden fenced in. But here you can see that the size of these foxgloves is fairly nice right now. They will bloom this year, but do remember that I started them last year. Nevertheless, if you can get the small plants or if you already have your foxgloves going, go ahead and put them in this garden. This is an enduring garden. This is a lasting garden. It may not bloom. Everything may not bloom this year, but it will continue for you next year. Now another staple for our Beatrix Potter garden, or Mrs. Helis is what we shall refer to her often throughout this video, are the hollyhocks. Now you may remember in the last video I showed you hollyhock roots. Here is a wonderful reason to start with hollyhock roots. Look at the size of the little hollyhock already and I just put it in, I just put the root in about four days ago. Now, if you grew hollyhocks in your Hopalong Hollow mini greenhouses, then you should be able to transplant those directly into your garden as well. You can also sprinkle some seeds in here and keep them well watered for this corner. The hollyhocks can go, grow to be 10 feet tall, and that's why they are in the back of this garden bed. Now in this garden, we're going to be growing according to size, blooming time, and color. These hollyhocks, this will be the only yellow in the garden, aside from the evening primrose. So we're going to have pale yellow hollyhocks, white hollyhocks, and these are black hollyhocks. Our colors for this garden are going to be pinks, purples, lavenders, and maybe a few vibrant purples. I'm not quite sure. We do have some vibrant, vibrant colors, but I want to stick with, uh, I want to stay away in this garden from the bright, bright colors. Now here in the back, up against the wall, we're going to do the larkspur. The larkspur, the rocket, this is an annual. I've already taken a few from another garden, 
right here and transplanted these. But now I'm going to take some of them from our mini greenhouses. And these are going to be about 48 inches tall. And these will bloom in early spring, when I say, I should say early summer, May and June. Larkspur are easy to grow from seed, but you want to sprinkle that seed in the cold months, either the autumn or the winter. In order for your Larkspur to succeed, it really needs a period of cold. Because this is so easy to grow right in the garden, I didn't need to put it in the mini greenhouse, but I did want to experiment with it this, this year. But when you're ready to release it, I'm just going to take the entire piece out. Like I'm removing a cake from a pan. Here I have a nice big chunk of larkspur. And from here I can just split it into parts. There you go. Now I can plant these in chunks in any garden that I want. Or I can spread them apart even farther. I like them growing pretty closely together, however. So I'm going to plant a lot of these right here in the back. The herbs we'll be planting in this garden will be bergamot, also known as bee balm. The bee balm is an herb that absolutely smells wonderful and it grows very, very tall and it does spread and that's what we want right now. We want them to spread, but not uncontrollably. It's easy to keep under control and you'll get so much of it that you'll be able to move it to other gardens. So we've already got some growing in there from last year, but I want to add a little bit more from the mini greenhouses. This is going to be planted amongst the larkspur because the larkspur, once it is bloomed, it is going to turn yellow and it dies a rather ugly death. But if we put this in with it, this doesn't bloom till late summer and autumn. And this will cover up the ugly stalks of the larkspur. If we want the larkspur to go to seed, that is, we'll leave it up. If not, we can cut it down. But this will be growing amongst it. And this will be our autumn bloomer. This bergamot is a wild bergamot. This, the flowers on this one will be a purplish color. And the bergamot that I have growing there already is more of a dark maroon bergamot. Now I'm going to put in some peony roots. I've amended my soil with compost and that is something you really should do is make sure that you have got some really good compost in your garden. And I'm going to take my next peony and I'm going to put it, oh, let's see, I'm just going to lay it right in there like that. Cover it up, up to the crown. Now because the foxglove are going to be early bloomers and then after the flowers are gone, they're just going to just die down to the ground. We need something to replace them in this garden. So I'm planting something that I don't think Beatrix Potter. She didn't have it on her list anyway. She probably would have planted though these if she had access to them. And this is Liatris. They're very inexpensive corms and they could grow to be five, four, five, even six feet tall. So I want them to take the place of the foxglove in the garden. They're purple. They grow really easily. They love the sun and they're pretty inexpensive. This is a really nice sized corm. You can see the little root system here. You can see exactly how you plant it. It's going to go right under the surface of the soil. And here's one that I had to dig up from another garden because it was in the wrong spot. But you can see that there's just spiky grasses. And they're actually quite fun and delightful if you look at them. <laughs> Even before they start blooming. And they will bloom for quite some time during the summer. So using my roots layer and my beautiful composted soil here, I'm going to dig a nice little hole and place my lovely little root in there, just like so, and just bury it on the surface like so. Yeah. 
I'll probably put about five of them in this section. Even though this is a flower garden specifically, we're definitely going to put a few vegetables in here. After all, we can't forget about Peter Rabbit. So I put a really simple teepee right there. Just a very simple throw-together teepee. Because it's basically, basically going to be covered up anyway, so I don't want to put a lot of effort into it. And I have put beans in there. And those are broad beans. Beatrix planted broad beans in her garden, or also known as fava beans. And I planted these in trays on March. Yeah, March 3rd, I believe. And I've got plenty to go in the garden, so I'm going to only put three. These are going to grow. I'm trying, going to try to keep them in the confines of that teepee. Planted three of them, and these could grow up to six feet tall. So that'll sort of be like an accent plant, but what I want them for is because they produce the most beautiful beans and beautiful blossoms, too. Today we have a couple real healthy fava bean plants growing. And I just wanted you to take a look at the buds and the blooms, I mean, because they are so very pretty. They are deep, deep purple or almost a black and ivory. And they look almost like little violet faces. I also like the color of the foliage because it's more like a grayish green. And that'll be a nice contrast amongst all the other plants in the Beatrix Potter patch. Isn't it pretty? Here in this lovely open space right here, I'm going to do the triangle planting of dahlias. And the dahlias that I showed you as roots in the last video, I put most of them in pots. But I decided that since we aren't going to get any more freezes, likely not going to get any more, I'm going to put six of them in this garden straight into the ground. Here are the eyes. And we're going to take this crazy looking guy here is the stem, and we're going to put the stem just above the surface and plant it into that beautiful, lovely, composted soil. Okay, so I've got a lovely, I've got a nice hole for my dahlia, and I'm going to bury it just right up to where it came out of the ground when it was split up. So you can see right there was where the stem is. I'm going to snug it in there. And just wait and see what happens. Here along the back on the building, I've got a twig trellis backed with goat wire. Goat fencing, actually, which makes a great trellis. And I'm training a clematis which is a wonderful perennial vine to grow along the back here. So when some of the flowers stop blooming, and they all will eventually, you want something to take their place, the clematis here, this particular clematis is called Angel's Bower. And this will bloom in late summer, and it will be covered with tiny little white, lovely scented blossoms. Here in this other garden, you can see a clematis vine. This one is in full bloom right now. So you can see how very beautiful that will be up against the back trellis in our potter patch. So right here in the front border, we're going to go according to height and color. And I'm going to put in a couple of those little beauty plants that I grew in the mini greenhouses and then moved to the pots such as this blue sage which is also a sal um, also known as salvia this gets about 18 inches tall so we're going to keep it really close to the front border but what i'm doing is i'm working some really nice compost right into the earth and then giving it a nice fluffy composition here because I also want to sprinkle some seeds. I want to, this to be really full. So I will sporadically place the little sage plants or the cottage pinks, whatever I'm putting up here. And then I'll also sprinkle some seed just to make sure we get a nice full covering without the weeds. 
Now we're going to add some of the cottage pinks that I had growing in the mini greenhouses. And I've already used them in one spot over there. Now, one of the main things you need to remember when you're planting a garden is that you want to repeat things. Repeat your plantings. If you planted um, three dahlias in one spot, go plant three dahlias in another spot, maybe on the other side, because you want some continuity in your garden, and that's one way to get it. Layering is another thing. That just means that you're putting tall plants in the back, medium size in the middle, and the little short ones in the front. So you're making it interesting by layering things and giving your garden different levels. And this whole plan will be on paper, so it will be easy for you to follow. in the next section of the video. Moved the pinks from the mini greenhouse. They look like they really want to get out of there. Look at the roots. We really should have taken it out a while back. I need to give these a really good soak and I'm going to split them apart just like I did with the salvia and plant them in little chunks like, <laughs> like big brownies into the ground and then they really need a drink very very badly so I think I'll give them a drink first I've got work projects going on everywhere but this is such a beautiful time of the day I don't mind if you see the trash in the yard right now because the way the shadows hit in the afternoon like this. It's just something else. Ah, planting a garden is just the most beautiful thing. It's like opening a, a little window into heaven, creating beauty in a little patch of earth. What a wonderful thing to do. I think if more people gardened, we'd have a lot more happiness in this world and a lot more appreciation for what is good and right and solid. Last few clips were taken um, over the last week and now we're back here in the garden a couple days later and we're getting bouts of rain so I'm going to try to tie the... Guys! Guys! Shh! Try to be quiet, okay? No, really. Go on, get. We're going to try to tie this up before we go in the house and actually look at this plan on paper. All the small plants that we put in are starting to fill out. Even the few snapdragons that I had in my mini greenhouses seem to be doing pretty well. And you will also notice that sprinkled throughout here are evening primrose. That's going to give us a buttery yellow color in early spring, but you can cut those down after they bloom and they will bloom a second time in the summer or the late fall. I'm also doing pink primrose in this garden, but these are a short plant, so you will want those in the front. And we don't want to forget the roses in your Beatrix Potter garden. You've got to have roses. Now whether you plant a um, climbing rose up your trellis, that's a great idea going up the side of your backdrop here. Or in this case, these are absolutely crazy wild roses that started out as one little stick that I got in the woods and now they've taken over. So this will constitute my Beatrix Potter roses for this garden. The next tab in this garden is going to be garden phlox. This is a definite cottage flower. It's a perennial. In my garden it grows to be about 30 inches tall and I've planted them here in a triangle shape of three. But I've also done the repetition planting where they're also over on this side in a transfiguration of three. So remember, you really want to use the repetition to get your garden a beautiful, continuous look where it just blends together even though there's all kinds of boisterousness and activity going on in your garden. You don't want a Mod Podge. It is a cottage garden, and sometimes a cottage garden is a Mod Podge, but you can make it a lot more artistic 
if you just follow a few simple rules. Another thing is we don't want any blank spaces in this garden, so take some of your seeds, like your little forget-me-nots, beautiful little forget-me-nots, get some sweet william, something that grows short, and sprinkle those little seeds in the little areas where you don't have anything, because we want this to be an abundant and full garden. As you can see, I've got little seedlings coming up already because I sprinkled, I think it was sweet william, and scented stock in here. Those are fairly short plants, but any kind of pinks, cottage pinks, um, uh, even uh, short uh, cosmos would be beautiful here. Cosmos does come in a dwarf size, and those will bloom all season long. So we just want constant color in our Beatrix Potter Garden. And I think as we move along, this will start to be clearly more and more beautiful every day. I hope to be able to get rid of all these barricades very soon, as soon as these plants get a stronger foothold. But one more thing I'd like to say is don't ever underestimate the value of compost. The more you use, the better. I really swear by compost. It is what I plant into. It's what um, you renew your gardens with. You can mulch with it. It looks good. It really does. You can buy it by the bag. You can collect it from a farmer or you can make your own. So don't forget that compost is your garden's very best friend. So I think everything is going along pretty nicely right now. Everything's growing just as it should. And even though I have a head start on you, it doesn't matter. This is a lifetime garden and every year it'll just get better and better and better. This is just the beginning. Everything here is going to get so much taller and so much more beautiful. Now let's go inside and take a look at this on paper. So here we have a perfect paper garden. Ah, if my real garden grew like this, with everything blooming at the same time, it would absolutely be glorious. But of course, reality tells us that that does not happen. These plants will not all open at the same time, but I thought it would be great to give you a 3D representation of what the garden could look like using the different layers and the different repetition plantings. Miniature garden, you can see represented at least a dozen of the plants that you could put in a Beatrix Potter patch. Isn't it sweet? <laughs> now, as I mentioned before about layering, you want to plant in layers, so you want your short things in the back. It just simply makes sense, doesn't it? Because you want to be able to see these little short plants, and if they're behind something tall, you're never going to see them. So here we have the pinks. An interesting thing about pinks, which are just little bitty carnations, wonderfully scented, uh, spicy, with a spicy scent, little pinks that will bloom all season long. It's interesting to note that the color pink was actually named after this flower and not the other way around. Pink originally meant to perforate or to um, make a jagged edge, such as pinking shears, for example. But the little flowers of the pinks, the teeny little carnations, they have very jagged little zigzaggy edges. And they grow pretty close to the ground and they have a silvery gray foliage. Now my colors in here are not necessarily true to life because I just was working with the paper that I had. Now here we have the blue sage salvia, which actually can come in deep purples, deep blues, pale blues, but you want to do the repetition planting. So here we have a little grouping of blue salvia over here, a little grouping on this side, and another little grouping over here on the edge. And note how beautiful they look with each color that I place them with. So if I place them with the pinks, they're absolutely gorgeous. And if I place them with a yellow flower here, which I'm going to say that this is going to be a uh, probably an evening primrose, which is in this garden, or uh, maybe a pale yellow zinnia, which we also want to put in this garden. So the pale yellow zinnias mixed with that blue contrasting colors, really beautiful together. These full flowers represent 
the peonies and the dahlias. And I planted purples, kind of actually more like a dark lavender, and pinks of the dahlias and the peonies. Peonies are spring bloomers, but even if the flowers die and the blooms fall off, the foliage is still there and it's still very beautiful. Whereas the dahlias will start blooming in summer and they should keep on blooming all the way through the fall. In Beatrix Potter's garden, her dahlias usually bloomed through October and then she would dig up the tubers. We don't have to dig up the tubers here in East Tennessee. It just doesn't get cold enough, but you can see here one of her illustrations of the dahlias. Dahlias actually come in just about every size you can think of from dinner plate dahlias to the little round pom-pom dahlias. And I actually prefer the smaller ones and I love the ones that are just the little round balls. And I've got a lot of the tubers, not in this garden. This garden's going to have fairly good sized blooms. And a lot of people don't want to plant them because they think it's kind of a hassle to have to dig them up. But depending on where you live, you don't really have to dig them up if you mulch them heavily at the end of the season and just protect them from the frost. Now, here again we have the phlox. And in this garden I planted blue and pink and I think of pale lavender phlox. And once again, we are going to do the repetition. So you've got, we've got flocks here, three flocks here, and then we want to go over to the other side, plant another three flocks, and then you've got your repetition and your continuity in the garden. In my gardens, the flocks never gets more than 30 inches tall, so that's sort of a middle of the garden plant, but where you live it might get taller. It's supposed to get 36, 38 inches tall, but generally here it doesn't. In fact, one of the first plants that uh, was given to Beatrix Potter to start her gardens was cottage phlox. Cottage phlox is a perennial. It comes in pinks, whites, purples, lavenders, and blues. Now, according to the plan, the tall plants are in the back. This is layering. You're staggering the plants so that just as in a painting, you want to be able to start in the front and see the panorama of the garden with all the little short ones in the front and getting taller and taller until you get to the absolute spires of the hollyhocks, the larkspur, and the, either the delphinium or the foxgloves. Now our area doesn't grow delphiniums very well, but if yours does, you are very fortunate. You could replace your larkspur with the perennial delphinium. But larkspurs are annuals and easily grown from seed, as I showed you. The larkspur will bloom for a couple weeks, and then it'll go to seed. It'll drop a lot of seed in your garden, so watch out if you don't want it to go to seed, because it really does go crazy in the gardens. This maroon colored flower here represents the bee balm or the bergamot in this garden. This will grow very, very tall, just almost as tall as the larkspur, and will take over for the larkspur once this fades out and starts dropping seed. So in my garden, I planted it in a sort of a maroon, but also I have some that's more of a pale lavender. So we are continuing with the color combinations, although this is a little more of a contrast and actually quite dramatic, I think, in this garden. Now you're going to have to check your area to find out the blooming times because depending on what zone you're in, that's when your blooming time will be. It might be different from mine. I'm in zone 7 and um, one of the early bloomers will always be the foxglove. They're basically spring bloomers. So those beautiful little flowers will be opening and just giving off a gorgeous show for quite a while. Whereas, in front of that, the liatris, which can grow to be just as tall as the foxglove, but it's going to start out as a squatty, little, brushy, grassy thing. It's going to take it a while to catch up, but by the time the foxglove 
is putting out seed, this liatris will be just as tall as the foxglove and taking the place in the color scheme. And about that time is when the hollyhocks should be opening. So you see, we're always going to hopefully have something blooming in this garden. You might want to incorporate outside of your short wattle garden fence would be violets and pansies and violas because they're so small you want them to be seen so you'll probably want them outside of the garden rather than inside. When Beatrix Potter moved to the Lake District and became Mrs. Helis and the owner of much property she actually became a gardener herself for the first time. She had gardens in the past but they were not her gardens. They were not gardens that she actually participated in growing. As the new gardener in the village, she was really impressed with the generosity of so many of the villagers who shared their plants and their seeds and their cuttings with her. But she also said that she had taken something from every single garden in the village, including a plant called Honesty. That's why we wanted to plant Honesty in this little Beatrix Potter patch. Her friend, Mrs. Satherthwaite, said that stolen plants always bloom. Another great reason for planting honesty, which is also called the money plant, are these little seed heads that are produced after the flowers bloom, which look like little rattling coins. Mrs. Helix, Beatrix Potter, often used her gardens for inspiration for her illustrations for her books. Here you see Jemima Puddleduck near that iconic green gate. A wonderful green gate that is. And here you may recognize the gate, the beehives, the walkway, and the stone wall. And in this illustration you see Jemima Puddleduck meeting the gentleman with the sandy whiskers amongst the foxgloves. Another illustration inspired by Beatrix Potter's gardens is Tabitha Twitchit here, disciplining her kittens amongst the peonies and irises. A watercolor illustration of the tail of the pie and the patty pan. And those look a lot like snapdragons to me, which we have also planted in our little patch. Might be fun to incorporate a couple cabbages in this garden as well, just for the sake of Peter Rabbit. You may remember in the last video I asked you to participate in this one by planting some honesty seeds. Now you know why. Now mine got knocked off the window right when they had just started to germinate and so I had to start over so I don't have very tall ones yet. This is why they haven't gone into this garden at this point. So the honesty or the money plant or the luminaria is something that you can incorporate as well into your Beatrix Potter patch. Now, if you want a really full garden in all these open spaces, you can sprinkle seed. And the seed that I've sprinkled in here are evening primrose because it doesn't get any taller than about 10 inches. Forget-me-nots because of that beautiful blue color, Chinese forget-me-nots is what I want. And also a yellow primrose. I'll put a link to my website where you can take a screenshot of this garden plan, as well as a list of everything that I planted in this garden. There's so much more that you could put in here. Just get the Beatrix Potter book and you'll see all the different combinations that you could make. But I think this is going to be a beautiful garden once it gets going, and hopefully it will look as good as this paper garden. Now I'm going to take this paper garden and I'm going to put it in its rightful place in front of a little thatched cottage. And now the perfect spot for the Hopalong Hollow paper garden is right here in front of Trimble Manor. Explain the process of the garden sufficiently so that you could follow it. Otherwise, you can make your own garden plan, obviously, and you might want to purchase that book, Beatrix Potter's Gardening Life by Marta McDowell, because there are so many more things you could plant in this garden. In the meantime, 
Have a beautiful, beautiful spring. From Hopalong Hollow, this is Jerry. Bye-bye.